Hey, Staten Island. This is HealthWish, a conversation about the state of healthcare in the fabulous fifth borough. Our aim is to raise issues, raise awareness, and raise health. Because when we raise health, we raise everyone. Today, from Violet Cellar, HealthWish is back for part two of our conversation with Staten Island University Hospital's Director of Otolaryngology, Dr. David Hiltzik. Give a listen. I remember we were speaking earlier. You said you like to, to run and bike and Yeah, no, that. being out in nature is very helpful for me. So I like, I like that, you know, because you have your time. Being with, I mean, being with my kids is the best distraction and getting connected into their worlds because, you know, it's, it's such an alternative to the one that I live in. So mm-hmm. it's nice to join theirs and think it's nice to engage them and help them. So that's, I think, great. Cooking is very enjoyable to me and mm-hmm. relaxing. Because you're doing something sort of slightly technical, so cooking's um, like an important part of my relaxation, and I also very much like um, art. So I like going to museums a lot because mm. that's where you're just getting a whole sampling of things that are very different than uh, you know the world that I'm living in. Do you have a typical style that you like to look at? It, it's changed over. The course of time so I, I did like an art minor in college oh, so really? so i was very into like mo- you know more impressionist like early 20th century or you know it's like it's like the you know and then you evolve but then as you sort of learn things you move to like the picasso and like the jackson paul and then then you go to like contemporary art which is all really like fun and interesting and and, and there's so much to pay attention to because there's like the content of, and the narrative, which are certain pieces, or it's just colors, which I love colors. And Do you do any then, painting or drawing yourself? I have or? a dream of an art piece I would like to make that's medically related, but I have to find the right person to do that with. I did have an artist patient that we had talked about, <laughs> that, but I had never got to a studio, so I don't want to give too much weight. No, 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 <laughs> please. But, but it's a little bit of we'll a do an social unveiling. commentary on modern medicine and sort of sometimes the dehumanization mm-hmm. and the fact that we're actually all uh, everything about our medical interaction is 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 uh, sort of made into something numerical. You know, and it's funny you know? too because medicine, as since it's a hundred percent science based and fact based, it can come off a well, little but sterile. A lot of art. But a lot and of that's art. and yeah. that's the thing. It's yeah. it's you know, and what's art, right? It's um, it's like to evoke emotion, and it's interesting to hear. Not only do you appreciate that aspect of it, but you literally want to express that medical side of you via art. Yeah, yeah, no, because the the uh, like when you walk in, right? Like everybody gets a medical record number, mm-hmm. and then you have an account number, which is related to the whole finances, and then there's a diagnosis number, and then there's a procedural number, mm-hmm. and then there's the phone numbers. <laughs> yeah, and so then there's so many parts of that. That it's that sort of what your visit ultimately is communicated through. Yeah, and, and experience, I think, is a large part of it too. I feel like most people nowadays, especially, sort of base their decisions on what their experience is going to be like uh, in addition to the outcome. And I feel like, you know, as technology advances and, and becomes better, there's a period of time where it was just like just the technology and the tech and, you know, uh, how advanced. But now we've sort of progressed to a point where it's like, you know what, I, 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 I like the human side of these experiences as well. And it's great to hear that. You well, know. it's nice to hear you guys in your generation, because with this whole COVID experience and, and the move to telemedicine, there's a lot of that. So there's elements of that that's added, which are some, but which I can elaborate on, but the, but there's a lot of it that's detracted because being in the same space, which is why like I like the, the difference between our interview over Skype and yeah. the interview in mm-hmm. this, obviously is very different, yep. right? It, I mean, this is a much warmer right. experience. experience for sure. I mean, obviously the environment's nice too, but the part you get from telemedicine doing it is someone in their own environment is you actually do see, which has been like a whole topic with all the Skyping and Zooming is what's going on in the background. So you can get a <laughs> sense of like mm-hmm. what's what the, where the people live, but I'd say, but largely it does take away from that, uh, that real in-person connection. Mm-hmm. And I think like, being in Staten Island, which may be a comment of the uh, Staten Islanders, are that a lot have wanted to come back to the office mm-hmm. and and have that one on one. Even patients who are 
or a little higher risk or a little of older age or whatever that they've all wanted to come in. So what was it like to remain open during this entire time, but also how did telemed kind of factor into what you were doing? It was a necessity. So, so what ended up happening is you incorporated and you you used it for what you needed it for. So I think that for me, the goal is, is, is if safe and appropriate, than to have the patients come in. So there was a little bit of a, uh, a, a screening tool because some patients you talk to and see, and then you're like, we can't really do this over the phone. You really right. need to come in. Because the point was no one wants to go to the emergency room. So we acted more like was sort of uh, an, an ear, nose, and throat urgy care. Mm-hmm. And so when there were like uh, major issues of like real acute um, uh, circumstances like nosebleeds or people losing their hearing or losing their voice or things that of that nature or, you know, um, growths that just kind of started in in a variety of places. Like you'd see them maybe online and then you'd be like, yeah, uh, you need to come in because we actually need to take care of this. And so that was kind of, so that was more, uh, the acuity of the patients was higher during the experience. And then, uh, you know, over time that you know, honestly, as the, the other, and the other thing I would say is like everything was changing. Like as we all experienced, like we were going from week to week to week with all new set of circumstance to works with. Yeah. So we've thought about the concept of doing teleconsults, but the way we can kind of do that is by having uh, like people videoing those parts of the exam. So we're working on that actually with our PAs where we have an app on a, a uh, hospital-based phone that you can connect to some of our cameras, like our fiber optic cameras, or we can then do a, an exam and they can either do it live, you know, right. and we tell them as that, or they can save the video and then under obviously the appropriate technology and encrypting to send us the videos. But but that but you need to have someone there who can do those right. things. Yeah, and and for me, like the tech part of things is interesting because I um, consider myself a little bit of a, a tech geek, and you know, like. Over the weekend, um, we, we did a social distanced barbecue um, with the family and my brother had brought over his Oculus. The VR goggles? Yeah, and uh, the Quest. And it's free motion. You have these these controllers in your hand that you actually view as your hands within the system. Incredibly high def, super immersive. And the first place my mind went to is, wow, you could actually use this sort of technology in medicine. Of course. You yeah, know? yeah, people are working on that. It's going to get to the point where you're... Yeah. We're having this experience, just maybe not actually in person. You know, you'll be able to look around. You have the depth perception. You have the high definition right. uh, graphics, but you just won't have the actual physical. Right. Or, you know. or the problem is you don't have the chemistry. And there's that right, part right, of it. Right. The, but, yeah, the but yeah, no, but true. Right? Yeah, but true. No, but very true. No, that we're as a specialty, we're very technology driven. So mm-hmm. the quality of our scopes and our uh, visibility and everything makes all the difference in the world. Yeah. And that's where there's been a lot of the evolution um, in terms of the size of the cameras, the their distal chip scopes that were that are like high definition. And then even the robotic arm of that, we're going from where they're the the newer technologies of flexible arms that are kind of going in and using those kind of flexible cameras to do work. So that's all. And then the truth is the virtual just to shift or is, is really more for uh, teaching. Yeah. Learning, right. Because yeah. obviously you have to real life, you have to actually be with the person. But a lot of that, there's been a lot of that studied in terms of planning, sur- surgical planning mm-hmm. uh, and some of the more complicated cases, but also for education in terms of teaching technical skills, you know, and along those lines. Yeah, it's definitely going to. Uh, maybe it's too soon for a lot of that technology to be uh, a standard or like an everyday practice thing. But I mean, it's 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 there between that and augmented reality. So augmented reality is very interesting, actually, especially when you think about it in 10 or 15 years from now. Right. So a few years back, we had Google Glass and it wasn't that big. But conceptualize that 10, 15 years from now, it's almost Avenger, you know, Tony Stark esque, where you can see scans and things right next to the patient potentially. I don't well, know. Anyway, be- you can call up the whole medical record while you're looking at the patient. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Instead of having the computer and, or typing in right. front of the computer like that. I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it depends on how creative you want to get. Mm-hmm. It's interesting to think about those advances in medicine, but like we've been talking about, not getting rid of the human experience of it, right? Always. And, and not yeah. 
streamlining it so much and making it so technical and technologically advanced that you get rid of that human feeling because there is something uh, there is something to seeing your doctor you came out eight years ago yeah what's it like to get that call hey that's Hiltzik. uh you know we want you to build an ent program out in staten island what take us through what that's like and then how you came to where we are now yeah was, well <clears throat> so i was working at lennox hill and my uh, mentor at the time was in charge of sort of i get what what is now called the western region and so they had um sort of a need to develop in-house programming at the hospital. So we'd have our weekly sort of meetings and on the agenda was always like Staten Island. And so he's like, oh yeah, we're looking at this person to maybe go out there. Can we get this person? And then so one week it showed up on the agenda and uh, it got to it and said, so David, when you start in Staten Island in July, and I just looked up <laughs> like, um, in what are you talking about exactly? <laughs> and so, you know, it's been a tremendous unexpected turn in my life and what i you know i really have embraced sort of the whole um community aspect of being here the family oriented uh component of it the uh sort of the the need for high level ent care as well so you know and we've kind of really um made the best of that and continue to you know, continue to improve and, and do things better, which literally we're doing every day in terms of, you know, all the things we talked about, technology, care, personnel, like we've made, and all the expanded partners that I have so that we're able to subspecialize into different areas to get even a higher level of care. So we've been like, part of not is not only growing sort of the volume of patients, but more importantly, and what's been more rewarding for me is to grow the uh, programmatic mm. uh, aspect of care so that we're able to have uh, a high level in each of the subspecialties of ear, nose, and throat. So, so when, you know, you come out here eight years ago, what did that look like and, and how quick or slow was the growth? How'd you, how'd you choose the team and the subspecialties that you wanted to have? And Well, a lot, a lot of it's um, sort of, came, well, I started off basically with me, a chair and an assistant. And then we kind of went from there and we had tremendous support from the hospital. The emergency room is very busy. So that's where you're going to get an immediate amount of referrals right there. So once they knew we were here and that we were here every day and very accessible, and then you had to prove that your quality of care was, was obviously of a high level. So that was very important. And then you end up, you know, going out into the community and meeting all the different primary care doctors initially, then go moving over to some of the, specialists and just you know hey you know we work at the hospital why don't you uh this is what we offer let give let, let's see how we can take care of your patients and thankfully we've had a, we've built a lot of good relationships in a lot of different areas and then as you kind of evolve you sort of see well what are sort of the needs head and neck cancer was a huge one so we have a whole endocrine program where we work we're doing a lot of thyroid surgery and parathyroid surgery. So we've developed that because that need was certainly here, particularly in the hospital. There was a real need for speech and swallow. So we helped them develop that program. Now we're in, the, in doing a lot of hearing rehabilitation. So that's been kind of our uh, uh, hearing and balance program. So we're actively very much expanding that. We have an otologist who, who's an ear specialist who comes in, you know, a couple times a month to help fill that gap. So we've really, uh, you know, really tried to get that next level of care. And also, uh, even in sleep medicine and facial plastics, which is what Dr. Omnitron will do. So by kind of making that, you know, that, that's another way of delineating our practice that's sort of different from the rest of, uh, you know, the practices on Staten Island is that we do have that subspecialty component connected to a high quality hospital. And you know what? What's interesting, something you said earlier was you, you, you were originally at Lenox and then you, you, you came out here and then trying to recruit other docs to come out here as well. I feel like there's such a, a misconception, right, that I have to go to Manhattan to get the best quality of care. But like you, in your case, you came here from Manhattan and uh, you said Fridays, right? You still are over yeah. at Lenox. So trying to change the community's idea of I have to go to Manhattan to get the highest quality of care. It's like, no, well, you, your doctor <laughs> who you go to in Manhattan 
is actually also in Staten Island. So you're, t- no. you're taking you're taking away my my uh, my quotes here. That's, no, no, because it's no, it's very important. Because I think a lot of people, if they can get a high level of care on the island, they'd rather not leave. And so the whole point is that that it's basically living up to that expectation of going you know out off the island to say like hey actually you can get all that here and that's another thing like i've had to prove and like my one of my favorite things which was brought up to me when i was doing another interview was well you may end up seeing patients in manhattan and you have staten island patients who work in manhattan who are going to you because you're the staten island doctor and lo and behold that has happened Mm. (laughs) because a lot of the patients who end up seen in Manhattan is because they work there. Mm -hmm. And so what's been fun is when I have a patient who comes in and says, actually, you know, my family was, you took care of my family in Staten Island. It's more convenient for me to see you in Manhattan. So I'm going to come and (laughs) see you here. And that was like a tremendous sort of, uh, you know, flip uh, of (laughs) of what your expectation will be. And that's where we'll pick up next time. Does Dr. Hiltzik have a favorite medical or surgical procedure? Tune in and find out. HealthWish wishes to thank our very special guest, Dr. David Hiltzik, Director of Otolaryngology at Staten Island University Hospital. We're very interested in your health wish. Contact us at healthwish at northwell.edu. Thanks for joining us. We hope to see you again soon.